Today, I'll be discussing the measurement and interpretation of oxygen saturation, including its limitations. To start off, what exactly is the O2 sat and pulse oximetry? O2 sat refers to the proportion of circulating hemoglobin that is saturated with oxygen. Unless otherwise specified, the term O2 sat implies the O2 sat in arterial blood. The higher the O2 sat, the greater the oxygen content in blood that is traveling from the heart to the peripheral tissues. It's calculated as the ratio of oxyhemoglobin to the sum of oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin. There are multiple methods that can be used to determine the O2SAT in a patient. However, within the context of the physical exam, there is just one. It's called pulse oximetry. In pulse oximetry, a probe is placed directly onto the skin, most typically consisting of a small hinge device that fits on the end of a finger, though there are other variations. The probe contains two light-emitting diodes, one diode that emits red light with a wavelength of 660 nanometers, which is the region of maximal absorption by deoxyhemoglobin, and one diode that emits infrared light with a wavelength of 940 nanometers, which is in the region of maximal absorption by oxyhemoglobin. A detector or sensor, usually placed on the opposite side of the probe, then measures how much light of the two wavelengths was transmitted through the tissue. And using complex processing to include only the pulsatile blood from the arteries, it determines the ratio of interest. Notably, pulse oximeters do not measure the actual concentration of either oxy or deoxyhemoglobin, only the ratio between them. So for example, they cannot be used to detect anemia. The other methods that can be used to determine O2SAT require a blood sample to be run through a machine called an ABG analyzer, in which the acronym ABG stands for arterial blood gas. Most ABG analyzers don't actually measure O2SAT, but instead calculate it from a mathematical description of the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve, incorporating the effects of things like the blood's pH and temperature. A small number of newer analyzers instead perform something called co-oximetry, which is superficially similar to pulse oximetry. It is the most accurate of the three methods. Instead of just two wavelengths of light, co-oximetry uses additional wavelengths to account for absorption by abnormal forms of hemoglobin called methemoglobin and carboxyhemoglobin. Also, because the arterial blood has been removed from the body, there are no issues with distinguishing the absorption of pulsatile flow from that of non-pulsatile flow. O2SAT is measured by pulse oximetry, is referred to as SpO2, whereas O2SAT as measured or calculated from an ABG is called SAO2. The fact that both measured and calculated ABG O2SATs have the same term is suboptimal. There is also something called pulse co-oximetry, which as you might guess, is a non-invasive way to measure methemoglobin and carboxyhemoglobin. But these devices are very expensive and uncommon. Returning to conventional pulse oximetry, there are a number of substantial limitations to its measurement. First, for the measurement to be accurate, there needs to be a good waveform, which refers to the pulse oximeter's ability to detect pulsatile flow. On some devices, that waveform is visibly represented on a screen from which you can determine for yourself whether or not it just appears to represent normal shape and rate of arterial pulse. On other devices, the waveform is not represented and the device is supposedly designed to simply not provide any number at all if it does not sense pulsatile flow. But unfortunately, sometimes these devices will still provide an O2SAT even when the signal for pulsatile flow is poor. But if the waveform is not displayed and you only see a number, you will not know it's inaccurate. And this is an issue with some devices. Situations associated with an inadequate waveform include poor positioning of the probe, motion artifact from shivering or a tremor, low perfusion pressure, 
that is a poor pulse, which can be seen in shock in peripheral vascular disease affecting the limb on which the pulse ox probe is placed, and hypothermia. And sometimes probes are just finicky, particularly ones meant to be left on the body for extended periods of time, in which case you may need to just try another location. Some situations that lead to false low O2 sats include prominent venous pulsations, which can result in some of the low venous oxygen saturation influencing the pulse ox reading. This can be seen with severe tricuspid regurgitation. Some shades of nail polish can also impact the pulse ox, particularly green and blue. If this is the case, problems can be averted by placing the pulse ox probe on the finger sideways. Causes of falsely high or falsely normal O2 sats include the presence of carboxyhemoglobin, as seen in carbon monoxide poisoning, and dark skin pigmentation. And causes of generally inaccurate O2 sats, meaning that they can either be falsely high or falsely low, include the presence of methemoglobin, which is a rare but serious side effect of some medications, and ironically, hypoxemia. That's right, the lower the O2 sat is, the less accurate the reading. Is there a particular O2 sat threshold below which the specific number becomes no longer helpful? Some papers in internet sources reference expert opinion that threshold is below 80%, while one meta-analysis puts it at below 70%. Even at modest hypoxemia, the range of error on pulse oximeters is surprisingly high. The quantification of the accuracy and the precision of pulse oximeters is a complicated subject. However, in extreme brief, the FDA has a recommended standard for traditional pulse ox devices for their average root mean square error, or ARMS, to be less than 3%. This is an oversimplification of what that means, but if a pulse ox is just meeting that standard were to read an O2 sat of 85%, there is an approximately 68% chance that the true O2 sat is between 82 and 88%, but there's still a 32% chance the true value is outside that range. When individual contemporary devices in common use have been tested by independent parties, they often perform better than this, typically with an ARMS closer to 2%, but that still seems like greater error than most people assume. Part of this error is systematic bias in one direction, which tends to remain relatively stable in a given patient, such that using the pulse oximeter to follow short-term trends in oxygenation will lead to more sound management decisions as compared to making decisions based on a one-time value considered in isolation. If that doesn't already seem problematic enough, one of the aforementioned issues deserves additional attention. The impact of skin pigmentation on accuracy. Although it had been known beforehand, a widespread appreciation of this did not happen until 2021 when both traditional media and social media picked up on one particular research letter published in the New England Journal of Medicine. What that letter described is that as compared to white patients, Black patients were more likely to have SpO2 measurements that are significantly higher than the simultaneously measured SaO2. This phenomenon, known as occult hypoxemia, can result in black patients not receiving supplemental oxygen despite it being indicated. There are also certain treatment protocols in which therapies for specific pulmonary diseases, like COVID, are not offered in the absence of hypoxemia and thus black patients would be less likely to receive these therapies. This phenomenon also affects Asian and Hispanic patients, but to a lesser degree. Despite a good deal of research and attention in the last few years on a deep technical level, the cause of this observation is still not well understood, particularly since it's not a matter of all patients of color being impacted to a similar degree, and the degree of inaccuracy in an individual patient cannot be predicted from that individual's skin tone. But it is an important problem of which to be aware, particularly when treating black patients affected by diseases which could impact oxygenation. In such patients, you should have a lower threshold to double check oxygenation with an arterial blood gas. Having discussed all those limitations with measurements, 
what actually is the normal range for oxygen saturation in healthy people. It's often cited online as 95 to 100% when at sea level, but consistent with these so-called normal ranges for other vital signs, this one is lacking strong evidence. It's consistent with my personal experience, but there is some published literature that suggests this range may be too high in older patients. In one study of 791 patients age 65 and older, the lower limit of normal was determined to be 91% when considering the entire cohort except those with COPD, and 92% when also excluding those with cardiac disease, anemia, and a history of smoking. In another study of 103 healthy individuals with a mean age of 33, the lower limit of normal as determined by two standard deviations from mean varied from 95% when sitting upright to 93% while supine. And in a third study of 290 healthy individuals with a mean age of 61, the lower limit was determined to be 92%. Now to me, 91 and 92% sounds too low for a lower limit of normal, even in the elderly, but yet that's the data we have. Regardless of what seemingly arbitrary value you consider to be an abnormally low oxygen saturation, what is known as hypoxemia, we can still talk about its etiologies. Without going too far down the rabbit hole of pulmonary pathophysiology, there are four primary mechanisms of hypoxemia. In one called VQ mismatch, the part of the lungs with the most blood flow is different than the part of the, that has the best ventilation. This is observed in pneumonia, COPD, and pulmonary embolisms. In the mechanism of impaired diffusion, there is a diffuse problem with the alveolar capillary membrane across which gas is exchanged, such as seen in interstitial lung disease. In a shunt, some amount of blood from the right side of the heart bypasses the lungs altogether, as seen in some forms of congenital heart disease. And last, in hypoventilation, the patient simply isn't breathing deeply enough or fast enough to deliver sufficient oxygen and expel carbon dioxide. This is the mechanism seen in hypoxemia from drug overdose, as well as a condition called obesity hypoventilation syndrome. I'll end with three common pitfalls and mistakes made with measuring and interpreting O2 sats. First, when using a pulse ox that does not show a waveform, either blindly accepting the measured sat or rejecting it when it doesn't seem to fit the clinical picture, rather than trying to confirm or refute the measurement with a better pulse ox or with an ABG. Second, not considering the possibility of occult hypoxemia in patients with dark skin tone who are presenting with dyspnea and a reassuringly normal or near normal O2 sat. And last, conflating the terms hypoxemia and hypoxia. You will often hear these used as synonyms but they are not. Hypoxemia is a state when the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood is low, which almost always goes together with a low O2 sat, whereas hypoxia refers to a state of low oxygen delivery to the peripheral tissues or low utilization by those tissues. Overall, oxygen delivery to the body is dependent not just on the oxygen saturation, but also on the concentration of hemoglobin and on the cardiac output but pulse oximetry is just an approximate measure of the first one of those three factors.